church and uh, today I'm going to uh, do a little bit of uh, a little more work with uh, uh, Ted Green page um, this is the lazy blues Ted wrote this in uh, let's see 19 oh my god I'm getting so blind I don't know 1993 1983 it looks like Ted would write tiny tiny letters <laughs> and uh, apparently he wasn't as blind as I am and um, Anyway, this is an interesting blues. It is uh, not really conventional. It's got kind of a certain vibe to it. There's some unusual voicings uh, in it, and I would like to go through it, play it a couple of different times, uh, and um, do a little analysis of what's going on so that you can um, incorporate some of these ideas into some of your other uh, playing. Uh, first off, <clears throat> I'm going to play it. Uh, there's a couple of very challenging parts in here toward the end, so uh, hang in there with me if I goof it up. Anyway, here's the Lazy Blues by Ted Green. And this is kind of, it says tempo de blues, whatever that means. I kind of think it means slow, on the slow side, um, and uh, which is fine with me because it's a bear to play some of these p passages. <laughs> Um, anyway, here's the, the Lazy Blues. I'm going to try and play pretty much what's on the page. Uh, there's a lot of um, sustained notes here, and I may uh, interpret those a little differently. Of course, that's what it's all about, you know, our own interpretation of this stuff. So here goes. This is the Lazy Blues by Ted Green. One, two, three, four. quick analysis of what's going on uh, harmonically. Uh, the first uh, measure has a, a D flat 7 sharp 9. I'm just going to talk about this chord for a second. D flat 7 sharp 9 might be the, uh, you know, or, or a dominant 7 sharp 9 uh, in general could be the ultimate blues chord in a way because it contains the both of the uh, tones that the blues plays this little dance with the, the natural third or major third and then the then the sharp nine which is also known as the minor third or flat third so it's got both of those notes living together in the chord uh, and it has a particular quality that uh, kind of conveys a bluesy feeling um, and I think it's a mistake to refer or think of this particular chord in this particular um, function as an altered chord because it's not functioning in that way it's um, it's really uh, specific to this situation it's not for instance going to G flat it's yet anyway it's it will later but it's not going there now uh, so that's D7, D flat 7, sharp 9. And then the, it's 5, so we're going to go to the 5 of, a, of uh, D flat 7, which is A flat 13, and then right back to it. And that's what Ted refers to as jump back, meaning that you go to the 5 of a chord and then come right back. Right? And then we go to the 5 minor. Um, which is an interesting thing. Uh, it's the companion minor to that D uh, flat chord, um, you know. And then it also goes right back to D flat, D flat nine this time. Now this uh, voicing, this voicing of D flat nine is interesting, and it's worth investigating because very often we 
when we play a ninth chord, conventionally, a, a, a kind of a normal ninth chord, right? We get the third down below, and then if we take Ted's voicing, we just pop that third up above. And uh, it's a little bit of a bear to reach that, but uh, it works out okay. Make sure you don't try and play the, 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 the key to this voicing or this kind of fingering is that you don't try and keep your first finger cocked like you might if you were playing a C chord or something in the first position, but actually point your first finger at, toward, the, toward the nut. So try this, put your fingers uh, three, two, three, and four right there on that fourth fret. They're all in the same fret, kind of bunched up together. And then just point at the nut or like reach over and touch the nut of the guitar. And, and uh, with the, like, extend your finger like pointing and then just play the note there that lives on there okay uh, it's subtle I hope I conveyed it clearly so we have from the beginning again we have D flat 7 sharp 9 I'm gonna say D every time is because all these flats make my brain tired and then the minor 7 A flat minor 7 and here's my D, nine, D flat 9 now watch this. Now that that's called um, A flat seven sharp five, and he says A flat seven plus. That's his old style of writing uh, sharp five. I, I'm not sure if he uh, stayed with that, but really it's it's not too different. You you raise uh, the top three string notes up and, and then down to the A flat in the bass, so it's not a huge shift. Does it again? This time it goes to G13 with a little bent fingered X. Now the X is an eighth note. And then uh, the G, the, the, the G, um, 13 chord is an interesting chord. It's the flat five of our one chord on its way to four. So this would be like an approach chord. It, you know, in this key, it looks a little weird because we're not used to seeing it. But if you were playing a blues and you say in C and you were on your way to F7 in bar uh, five, right before you go to F7, you might play a G flat seven just to sort of, you know, for a couple of beats to get to the F. And that's exactly what's going on here. It's flat five of one, uh, also known as a tritone sub, if you will. Um, and it's heading toward G flat. So uh, I'll play that whole business there. So from the beginning, D flat seven sharp nine, A flat 13. Flat seven sharp nine, A flat minor seven, then D flat nine, A seven sharp five, whoa, A flat seven sharp five, excuse me, back to D nine, D flat nine, and then this G thirteen, and then we go to the four chord, and now these chords in this bar are moving one chord per beat, whereas before they were moving. Uh, two beats per chord. <laughs> uh, and then so from bar, uh, in bar four, five, we have now a couple of things to pay attention to here. This is the first time we have these sustain lines or ties. So the bass note only gets hit uh, once in, in this and then we go to the D flat minor and then watch this top note and it's sustained over the B and then we hit uh, the, the X so that that whole bar there bar 5 says sorry bar 5 says sorry um, so maybe what would be a good idea is get the grips down Ignore the ties until you feel like you've got it under your fingers. Uh, and so, like me, you'll be able to do it later. <laughs> so here it is. And then the next bar 
is four minor. It, you know, interestingly enough, I'm not sure why this occurred, um, but Ted decided to call four minor um, by an enharmonic equivalent. So it, normally I would think of four minor as G flat minor in the key of D flat. Um, and uh, when I first looked at this, it confused me just for a second, <clears throat> only a second, mind you, just a second. Um, because I'm thinking I see F sharp and I and I and I think oh it's the three chord but it's not it's it's the the four minor of D flat and I don't know why Ted called it F sharp uh, maybe because he was um, decided that G flat minor to C flat seven would be a problem and I that would be my guess is that nobody likes to call a B note a C flat note <laughs> just because it kind of makes our head go wacky. So this is bar, uh, uh, what is it? One, two, three, four, bar five. We have four minor, and then it's companion minor, uh, oh sorry, flat, flat seven. So four minor, flat seven dominant, and then another four minor. And I'll play that again. And that is a what we, sometimes people call a backdoor 2-5. I'm not crazy about that term, but just so, in case you have heard that terminology, it's four minor to flat seven dominant moving back to one. So in this case, I'm going to say the correct, harmonically correct names for these chords. G flat minor to C flat dominant seven moving back up to D flat. Okay, so the line is... have this very cool bit where it says now this chord right here I'm gonna stop you and talk about it because it's it's a beautiful D flat major seven one three seven and three again but Ted does this trick that he invented I think called uh, tip double stop and he gets this very rich second inversion chord playing two notes with the tip of one finger so he's not flattening he's not flattening out like that oh you can see this good he's actually playing on the tip with his finger so that's another view okay so then there's this passage that says one two three and then a little guy here Now what that is, is flat three to flat six. And flat six is um, the flat five, what is it? it? It's the flat five of two dominant, which is kind of where we were coming from a minute ago. Uh, so we have one, two, three, and then flat, flat six and then six two dominant then two minor which is the big old stretchy then five then three this is a beautiful six that's actually uh, flat seven minor odd and then flat three dominant and then to this A major seven beautiful A major seven to A seven then two five and one okay I'm going to run that part again so just so we can talk about it we've got a two and a five and then when we go here to this which sounds like this um, and then F minor seven with with a then it's like a one so it's like three and then when you raise this note it makes it into D add nine and then uh, up a half step to uh, 
this B minor 11 chord, which is the companion minor to E7, and then E uh, A major 7, so that was a 2 5 of uh, flat 6, and then a 2 5. Okay, that's a handful, isn't it? So, what if this was in the key of C, numerically and everything, and seeing it would be maybe easier, but since it's in the key of D flat, and uh, we don't spend time in D flat as much, and there's um, some things can become kind of difficult to understand, but the mechanisms that Ted is using here um, are best understood by means of getting to the destination. So for instance, he'll approach uh, a chord by, uh, with a companion minor dominant, looks like what most people would call a 2-5. I don't think of it that way because it's not really acting like two or five of anything, but it's a substitute for a, a, a 2-5 of the destination chord. So for instance, if we're heading toward G flat, which is the four chord, Ted might say D minor to G, which would head there. Now, what that's going on, what's going on there is he's taking the flat five sub of the five of the destination, and then he's putting a companion minor with that flat five sub. So it looks like what most people would say a two five up a half step from its destination, and that's the, one of the most common. Uh, mechanisms that uh, is being used here okay so next thing let's let me play it one more time up a little bit a uh, quicker tempo not too much quick I mean it could you could play it faster maybe if you were um, really ambitious but I think the tone of this thing is to play it it's called lazy blues right one two three four It's very beautiful it flows very nicely now my guess is is that Ted might play this type of thing with a little bit more activity in the bass um, I haven't really planned anything out for this but I'm gonna I'm gonna see what I can do uh, to play this with a little bit more activity in the bass not a walking bass line per se although there are portions of the thing it's mostly in a two feel Boom, chickity boom, chickity boom, right? So if we if we uh, activate that bass line, it might sound something like this. for that <laughs> I did okay for the first few bars and then it fell apart a little bit anyway uh, that's one one way you want to get as comfortable with this uh, progression in these fingerings so that you can play around with that okay and and um, so the other thing that you can try to do 
again, I don't have any preparation on this one, um, but uh, you can try and decorate up the melody a little bit because there's plenty of room in this thing for more melodic decoration, which might be a, uh, a very feasible thing to do. So let's, let's see what happens if I try and put a few more X's uh, into these boxes, okay? One, two, three, four. a few of the voicings in order to get more um, melodic activity particularly the one that I changed the most was instead of playing this this pretty gruesome E flat minor seventh chord which I love the sound of um, but is very difficult to do anything with once you play it I went up to this one or you could say here or here any of those solutions might give you a little bit more melody. Um, please, uh, this is my opinion, of course, and other people might, uh, you know, take offense to this, but please don't treat this like classical music that has to be played, um, you know, one way and one way only. I believe that, and this was what Ted told me directly, is that these things are really just starting points, these pages. He didn't want to try and write, you know, these things like classical music. He wanted to write them so that the student could uh, interpret them in their own way and expand on them and really make music with them. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to uh, realize that it's, it shouldn't be treated too preciously. Certainly you want to uh, get to the point of it and learn as much from it as you can and sometimes you don't do that all at once you might do it over the course of years uh, taking a look at something playing it for a while coming back to it and playing it again with a different perspective um, but if something's difficult or impossible for you to play at this moment uh, come up with something that works in place of it and then revisit it later when you have uh, uh, maybe a higher skill level but don't let uh, a one chord grip or something like that uh, prevent you from getting um, the rest of the beautiful thing. Okay? So uh, that's it for Lazy Blues. Uh, forgive me if I was a little rambly and long-winded on this one, but I felt like it took uh, some time to explain what was going on. Um, and uh, for now, I'll just play it again a little quicker tempo. And uh, I'll say, see you later. One, two, three, four.